Today's video is on Genesis 6 through 9, the story of the flood. And before we jump into that, we got to go for a little field trip because it's just way too nice today. We're riding along the Templeton Gap floodway. This was built in 1949 by the Army Corps of Engineers. It's really designed to prevent flooding in Colorado Springs. One of the worst of those was in 1935. They had over 24 inches of rain in six hours. If you consider that Colorado Springs on average only gets 14 inches of rain a year, to get 24 in six hours would have been overwhelming for the city. There are still signs of this flood along Fountain Creek, like these old bridges that got washed away. You can still see evidence for that flood besides just the Templeton Gap floodway, but you have these old bridges that got washed away back in the 1935 flood, and the remnants of them are still standing. This one's pretty good. Most of them, you just have the piers still standing to this day. Fountain Creek was over 30 feet higher, they estimate, during that flood, and downtown Colorado Springs has marks where it was over 10 feet high on some of the buildings. All told, over 100 people in Colorado Springs in the area lost their lives in that flood. Okay, enough local history. Let's dive into some primordial history and look at the story of knowing the flood in Genesis 6 through 9. First, I gotta get home. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 or 30 years, I've been teaching biblical studies and theology at the graduate level. And the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in the classroom and put it on YouTube to encourage and stimulate you in your own understanding of the Bible. I thought I would use a little bit of local history today to introduce Genesis 6 through 9, the story of the flood. And the reason is, I think all too often when we read this story, we domesticate it. We make it into a kiddie's Sunday school lesson. But this is really a horrific story. What happened in Colorado Springs in 1935 is bad enough, but the flood that's mentioned here in Genesis is a flood of epic proportions. All life is going to be wiped out, human and animal. It's a cataclysmic horror story. Now, because this story covers chapters six through nine, it's impossible to cover or touch on every aspect in these chapters, let alone read them in this video. So what I would suggest is you pause the video here, grab the Bible that you use and a good cup of coffee while you're up. And then as we go through this video, pause it and take a look and check out what the passage is saying for yourself. Almost every of the ancient cultures from the Tigris Euphrates River valleys and the surrounding region preserve some form of a story about the flood. Egypt doesn't, nor does Greece. The inclusion of the flood story here preserves a very early tradition that predates their time in Egypt and was most likely brought with them during Abraham's migration from the Tigris Euphrates River through Israel and down into Egypt. I'm going to be taking a narrative plot diagram to this story just like I did in the last video on Cain and Abel, or should I say, Cain and God. And so if you want to learn more about that, I'll have a link up here to my video on how to do narrative plot diagrams or take a look at last week's video. The story of the flood runs from 6.9 to 10.1, even though we have a little bit before that in chapter 6. And the reason for that is that in the Hebrew Bible, we have these two toledot statements or toledot clauses where it says this is the account of, or this is the story of, or these are the generations of. And we see one in 6.9 and one in 10.1. And when I did the video on Genesis 1, I talked about how these Toledot, these, this is the generation of, or these are the accounts of, form the break points in the narrative throughout the book of Genesis. They really help you organize the text. Now, before we dive into deep to this story, we need to know that there are a lot of parallels between the flood story and the creation narrative. In this story, the windows of the heaven and the foundations of the deep are going to be opened and flood the land. And it's going to create a state of chaos. 
chapter 7, verse 11. Then when the flood waters recede and dry land appears once again, it's going to be very, very similar to the land being covered in water in Genesis 1-2, and then the waters receding and being gathered up in dry land appearing on the third day of creation in Genesis chapter 1. This is why many people see the flood story as a story of uncreation and then creation. Noah is also commissioned to be fruitful and multiply after the flood waters received, just like the male and female are commissioned on the sixth day of creation. Noah's drunkenness and nakedness after the fall also parallels Adam and Eve's disobedience and then realizing their state of nakedness within the garden. And finally, in the flood story, there's a new beginning, but also another fall that's going to take place. The great flood story here in chapters 6 through 9 is told in a way which focuses upon the idea that the earth is going to be cleansed so that no trace of sinfulness would be left behind or found. And the means to do this is going to be through water, something that we saw in creation. God controls and separates the waters, but in the rest of the Old Testament, no one has any control over the water. It's an area of chaos and uncontrol for the Israeli people. Another interesting feature about this story is that it seems to be drawn from two different oral sources. Now, before you jump on my case about biblical authors drawing from oral sources, you need to realize that most of the Bible was originally an oral source and then it was written down later. For example, the book of Psalms was primarily a sung or an oral source that gets written down later on. Luke explicitly states at the beginning of his gospel that he consulted eyewitnesses who passed on their accounts orally to write down his gospel. In 6.4, before we hit 6.9 with its adult, we have this mysterious story of the Nephilim having children with women. Somehow this resulted in humanity being set on evil all the time, so God regrets having created mankind and vows to wipe them out. But then in 6.13, after Noah is introduced, we get a second reason. That all of creation was ruined, not just mankind, but every creature was corrupt in its ways. So we get two reasons why the flood is going to occur. And then when the animals enter the ark, we're going to have two accounts of the animals entering the ark. And a lot of scholars really think this reflects the author drawing from two oral sources but not kind of compiling or homogenizing them together, but really maintaining their separate differences as well. Now, the double sources and the fact that this story comes from the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, I think really shows the age of this particular story. We also have a number of other stories that come from this region as well within the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Eden is over in the land of the east, and in fact it's even mentioned in conjunction with the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys. You have the Tower of Babel, which really seems to be a story that appeals to these ziggurats or these towers that were built in the Euphrates river valley. And then you also have parallels with flood stories from that region as well. By way of a side note, and I'm not going to charge you for this, this is a story about environmental and climactic destruction. And the question that it raises for me is why do so many Christian leaders, especially those on the conservative side, deny climate change or the needs that this challenge presents to our generation? It seems to me like of all the religious traditions, the Judeo-Christian tradition should be the most receptive to the warnings of climate change because here we've got a story, one of the foundational stories in our faith that talks about it itself. This is something that has happened in the past and is a challenge that is facing us today as well. Okay, back to our text. A popular view that a lot of people have about the ancient conception of the world was that the world was a disk and it floated upon water with a vault or a dome over top of it. The problem with this view is that the ancient people knew from everyday experience that materials like earth and cities and bricks did not float upon water. And from basic construction, they knew a dome of that size would be completely unworkable. Rather, their view of the world was one in which the gods structured and made the cosmos to function through their divine powers. Having said that, though, 
when this story is told, it is as if the world is floating. So the foundations of the deep are going to open and water is going to come up. And then the lattices or the windows in this dome are going to open and all that water above is going to pour through. It is told that way to convey an idea. It doesn't mean that they actually believed it because when you progress a little bit further in the Bible, you're going to see, for example, in Deuteronomy, that guy is going to say, if you obey my voice and keep my commandments, I will bring the rains in their appointed seasons. And so they definitely had an idea that weather was something that was climactic. It came and went every year. And also it was related to clouds. It wasn't related to windows or lattices up in the sky. Let's jump into the text and go to chapter 6, verse 11. At the very start in verse 11, God says that he's going to destroy humanity. All of the earth is ruined in God's sight. It is filled with violence. In verse 12, it says that God saw that the earth was ruined. And this use of saw recounts, Genesis 1-1, that God saw what he did on a particular day of creation, and it was good. Now when he sees the earth, it's bad. In Hebrew, we also miss a repetition of words here. Ruined and destroyed are both based on the same verb. This is sort of an eye for an eye or a lex talionis form of justice here. And what mankind has done, God is going to do in return. In chapter 7, verse 1, we have the turn on the top level of the plateau. God commands Noah to enter the ark. Now, we're all pretty familiar with this part of the story, and we've even had Sunday school songs about it. The key thing I want to bring out here is Noah's obedience. In 6.22, it says that Noah did all that God commanded him. In 7.5, it says that Noah did all that God commanded him. And in 7.9, it says that he did just as the Lord had commanded him. As we continue across this top plateau where the author holds us at the highest level of tension, the author's use of the windows of the heaven and the fountains of the deep are metaphorical, as I talked about before. At the same time, he appears to be using a very specific or mythical type of language, language that would resonate with the people when they heard it then. This is a story of epic proportions. It goes back to the very beginnings of the world and it is the work of God. The destruction pictured in this story reminds us of the lengths that God will go to to maintain his holiness. Only the cross will exemplify these themes more. In the very middle of the top plateau here, we have this statement where it says, God remembered Noah. Now in the Old Testament, when God remembers something or someone, it isn't just that he just remembered where he put his car keys. Rather, it's his turning toward and moving towards someone specifically because of a previous promise that he has made with them. And as Alan Ross writes, to say God remembered Noah is to say that God faithfully kept his promises to Noah in intervening to end the flood. In Genesis 1-2, we're told that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. After the flood recedes in our story in Genesis chapter 8, similar language is used once again. God made the wind or the spirit blow over the earth in 8.1. Wind and spirit are the same Hebrew word in both verses, ruach. And the verbal parallels connote the idea that God is starting all over once again with creation. In 8.13 through 14, we have other parallels back to the original creation story. The water just dried up from the earth and the surface of the ground. Now, earth and ground are the same words that are used in Genesis 1 to talk about creation and also in chapter 2 when God made the earth and then he formed man from the ground. In this story, both the earth and the ground have now been wiped clean by God. It is a time to start over. On the seventh day of the month, the ark came to rest on one of the mountains of Ararat. Once again, just like the seventh day of creation, when God rested, now the ark rests on the seventh day. In 8.15, we get the command, leave the ark. The author of Genesis portrays Noah as someone who obeys God in all of his commands. He waits in the ark until God instructs him to go out. God's command to Noah sets up the call of Abraham later on in chapter 12. 
go out from your country and your relatives and from your father's household, Genesis 12.1. Both men represent major turning points in the story of Genesis. Furthermore, both are heirs of God's promises and a covenant. The listing of the animals in 8.17 should remind the reader of seven days of creation in Genesis 1. And just in case someone might miss the connection between creation and the flood, the same command is given in the flood story, be fruitful and multiply. This command is repeated a second time in 9.1, just in case the reader misses this connection the first time round. Once the flood resides, Noah sacrifices some of the animals. In 821, it says that the Lord smelled this pleasing aroma. Now, I think this is included to set the reader up for Leviticus 1, where the whole burnt offering is described as a sweet and pleasing aroma to the Lord. After the flood, and as this story begins to resolve itself, we come to chapter 9, verses 1 through 17, and we have the Noahic covenant. In 9.1, God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now this takes us back to Genesis 1.28 once again. It restates the earlier commission, or perhaps it is meant to be understood as a new beginning for humanity. This is also the first unconditional covenant in the Bible. From this point on, God is primarily going to be conceived as a covenant-making God and one who keeps those covenants. In 9, 4 through 6, we have this interesting teaching about blood. Now, in the Old Testament, and especially Leviticus, life is in the blood, as in other places described where it's the breath or the spirit. Now, the point here is that we don't eat meat as long as there is life in it, and this blood represents the life. The point is not so much that life is in the blood specifically, but in a pre-scientific society, how would you know if something was alive or not? Well, the two best signs that you have is that it's still breathed and it's still bled. So if you were to eat meat with the blood that was still in it, this was tantamount to thinking that you were consuming the life of that animal. And this also reminds me of the old joke of the guy who thought he was dead and was going to a psychiatrist at the time. The psychiatrist was just so frustrated, he just could not convince this guy that he was still alive. And so finally he asked him, he said, do dead people bleed? And his patient goes, nope, dead people definitely do not bleed. So the psychiatrist takes a pin out, pricks the man's finger, and lo and behold, he starts to bleed a little bit. And the guy looks at him and he goes, well, how about that? Dead people do bleed. And to understand this, you see that the author continues with this prohibition against murder, to shed another person's blood. When we shed somebody else's blood, he's talking about ending or taking someone else's life, and God strictly forbids this. In 9.9, the Hebrew text and most English translations also open with this interjection, Behold, look, and this interjection demands that the reader pay attention to what is about to follow. I will establish my covenant with you. In 9.13, it says, I will place my bow in the cloud. Now, this could be a reference to a rainbow, but the Hebrew here is kisset, and it refers to a bow that was usually used in war or in hunting animals. Some interpreters have interpreted this in terms of God hanging up the bow that he used in his battle against humanity. And it signifies that the conflict is over. When God sees his bow hanging in the clouds, he remembers his covenant with the earth. Now this covenant is not between God and mankind, as is often assumed. It is a covenant between God and the entirety of his creation every living creature and the earth. And we see this in verses 11, 15, and 17. In verses 9, 18 through 10, 1, we have the concluding act to this story. And it's interesting how the Bible portrays all of its greatest heroes in all of their humanity. Noah's obedience and walking with God that was stressed throughout this story is now qualified by this really sad ending. 
Noah's story is a tragic one. It starts with the narrator telling us that Noah was a godly man in the midst of a corrupt generation. He was obedient to God's commands to build the ark. He and his family are saved from the flood. And after the flood, he worships God and God makes a new covenant with him. But then he goes and gets drunk and does something that is only referred to as his nakedness in his tent. We're not sure what this is, but the picture is pretty clear. The situation after the flood is as bad or worse than before the flood. The only godly representative of humanity has now blown it. In this story, God is pictured as the judge of the whole earth. At the same time, he is portrayed as the one who delivers those who his mercy is upon. And the responsibility of those who receive that grace should live accordingly. I've mentioned several times in these videos on Genesis so far that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are the introduction or the prologue, not just to Genesis, but also to the Pentateuch as a whole, or the first five books of the Bible. In this story, we see the themes of God's judgment on those who reject him, deliverance of the righteous, blessings and commands, which animals are clean for sacrifice and which aren't. And now we have the introduction of God's covenants. These are all ideas that would be developed in the first five books of the Bible. I hope this very quick skim through Genesis 6 through 9 helps you understand and see the structure of the flood story and how this sets up further stories in the Bible, but is also related back to especially Genesis chapter 1. There's been a lot to go through here and to cram all this into a 20 minute video, I think was a bit presumptuous on my part, but I hope it turned out okay. If you like these videos, be sure to subscribe, give it a big thumbs up. That helps YouTube know to rate these videos higher when people search for information along these lines. Next week, we jump into the story of Abraham in chapter 12. And until then, I'll leave you with the word of peace. It becomes sort of like a children's Sunday school class, you know, singing Noah, you know, <sighs> Noah built the ark, you know. <sighs> we domesticate it. We make it into a kitty's ch <sighs> We make it into... <sighs> ha! The account of the flood story is told primarily <sighs> when it says that Noah is a man of the story. <sighs> when it says that man... <sighs> When it says that Noah is a man of the soul...